In this video, I'm gonna talk about how and where I source my feedstock and what exactly is happening on the inside of this when I'm making char. This is where I get the majority of my feedstock for my biochar retort. There's a number of these bins that they bring out at all different times of the day, and there's a lot of different sizes and configurations of all of this material. A lot of it's reduced down to a pretty manageable size and it works really well in my retort because just how small it is to start with but most of this is dug fur and as you can see there's various different forms of stock here bee boxes that are used for beehives and I'm not sure how much they actually make out of this place but it's always constantly busy there's always material coming in and always material coming out. Another really valuable resource that I get from this facility is all of the livestock bedding that I use. And these are just all of the shavings and sawdust that they stick out here for people to grab. If you can locate a source that has something that's free, doesn't cost you any money, you know, all the better. And something like this is perfect size for what I'm using it for. A project that I'm working on with Rebecca where she's making biochar soap. There'll be half softwood, half hardwood. The hardwood portion of it is the portion that's going to be used for the creation of that biochar soap. The hardwood that I'm going to use is white oak, and I will reduce this down even further into two to three inch chunks, which will just expedite the processing and require less feedstock in the outer chamber. It's actually been about a month since I fired up the retort with all the wet weather we've had. And I've actually been a lot more focused on in-ground biochar production with some of the property cleanup projects that we've had going on around here. But today is the day and we are going to fire up the Tin Man. have some material remaining in here that was run through and it was somewhat incomplete and so this will just get run through again and process the rest of the way what I found works best in this system is utilizing material that is roughly of the same diameter in size as well as the same moisture content. It's a good representation of what will happen if you're not using material that is all of the same moisture content. I light it and forget about it and come back later. So there wasn't enough feedstock in the outer chamber to process this wet material. And as a result, this is what I was left with. We're gonna get her done today. And I'm also going to, on the top of this softwood, I'm going to be adding the hardwood on the top so when I'm done with the burn I'll be able to just fish that out and I won't have to search for it. Now I've actually run several experiments trying to see burning temperatures and whether or not this stuff could be used and how effective it would perform when compared to actual store-bought lump charcoal. I'll put a link in the description for that particular video that I did if you're interested, but this makes fantastic cooking material. Along with the size of the feedstock and moisture content, the other thing to consider, which is gonna promote a good burn, is a good airflow through the material, so it's important that this is placed in here fairly randomly, which is gonna to help to promote that. This lid is very deformed. It still has really good contact with the lid in this ring. And that's really what's going to allow the exclusion of oxygen. When I got this barrel new, it came with a retention ring, which is something that I have never used. But what I have used is the use of a heavy weight, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 pounds or more, that sits on the top of this. And that's what's helped to keep this seal from deforming throughout the heating and cooling process. This system runs somewhere north of 1250 degrees Fahrenheit and it's been able to maintain that integrity through more than now some 90 burns. Ten to fifteen minutes for it to go from this incipient stage to fully free burning. 
I'll come in one final time and I'll put heavier feedstock on top of the lighter, flashier stuff that's going beneath it. And that'll just give me a little bit more length in duration of my burn. And if I wanted to, actually, I could come back through here and continually put more material in. So if I was processing stuff that was maybe wetter, I could continually tend to this, which I don't typically prefer to do. But that is an option as the fire progresses down in this outer chamber. It's going to reach the contents of the inner chamber and start to heat that material up. And as that material heats up to its ignition temperature, it's going to begin to push off all of the volatile organic compounds. Those volatile organic compounds are flammable, and as they are forced out of the bottom of the inner chamber, they're going to travel up in between that space between the inner and outer chamber, and they're going to therefore reignite. And essentially that's the premise behind how a retort system like this works. It's later in the afternoon and I am going to crack this open and see how we did. It's still kind of hot. And the mark of a really nice clean burn is this pretty tan looking carbon on the inside of this. In fact, you'll have some of that tan carbon on some of this material. Sounds very metallic and it's completely devoid of all of those volatiles and it's just pure carbon at this point. I'm going to fish out all this hardwood. I don't actually really need that much of it. But this is going to be crushed down into a powder and used for the making of some soap. This is Douglas fir, and this is the white oak. Hope this video was helpful. Thanks for watching, guys, and we will see you in the next video.